Hi, I'm Ted Wolf, presented by Guidewise. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, where we connect you to the stories and insights of people who have mastered implementation. Why? Because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Join us as we uncover the secrets of successful implementation so you can conquer your implementation struggles. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, presented by Guidewise, where we focus on the topic of implementation because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Today, my guest is Tom Ulbrich. Tom is the president and CEO of Goodwill of Western New York. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Todd. It says on LinkedIn that you're very passionate about the transformation at the intersection of social impact and business best practices. Could you explain what you mean by that in a little more detail? Yeah, sure. So what what I really mean by that is I've had a bit of an eclectic career um, as an entrepreneur for many, many years of my life. Then I was in academia for a piece of that. And uh, when I was in academia, I was working with both the School of Social Work and the School of Management about what I call the entrepreneurial nonprofit or this intersection between the social sector and the for-profit sector. So my interest here is um, why can't nonprofits or social sector organizations be okay with doing well financially and, and being able to pay their people well, running a, with best business practices and doing good at the same time? My premise is you can do both. And I think sometimes in the social sector, people believe you have to be, for lack of a better word, um, a martyr at some level in order to be successful. And I and I just think there's so much more opportunity for nonprofits to do more mission when they run their nonprofit like a business. Okay. And in what way do they not run their nonprofit as a business? Yeah, I think... Um, I think that it, some instances, what what I believe happens, and is the the fact that sometimes what happens is there's the the focus on the mission and the people, and sometimes internally overrides the best business practices. Like there's this um, unspoken need to maybe give um, inside the business side of the nonprofit to give fourth, fifth, sixth, eighth, ninth chances to things, Um, giving people, not holding people accountable sometimes, maybe not doing great development. And of course, this doesn't apply to every nonprofit. There's great nonprofits out there that that have very good business practices. I noticed a lot with smaller nonprofits where they're started sometimes by somebody who has a lot of passion about something and forgets about the aspects of what does it take to run a sustainable business. How would you react to the saying uh, that um, people who run nonprofits are the artists? They're not the business people. Yeah, I I would say that 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 may have some truth to it. And it may align a little bit with entrepreneurship in the sense often the lead entrepreneur or the founder, right, is is a person that can bring together the passion around a product or a service. Um, pull together what I would call the chaos of building something brand new, pulling together the financing, a team, um, but they often are not the right people to scale the business at, at, excuse me, not the right people to manage the business when it gets at scale. So okay. I, I haven't thought about that. I think that's an interesting way to think about it. And, and in my head, it aligns very much with founders, many founders I've known in the entrepreneurial world. Like I know myself, I'm a great ideator. I'm great at all pulling those pieces together. But I know if I don't surround myself with great operational people to execute the vision, I'm not going to be successful or we're not going to be successful as an organization. Well, I would say that's just uh, business wisdom because because a lot of business owners and founders for profit organizations, uh, have the complex that they have to be the best at everything and the best person in the room versus hiring to their weaknesses to complement them. So um, congratulations that you've reached that point of humility, which we all do eventually in life. I think if you're in business long enough uh, to know you're not great at everything. So you have focused then at the nonprofit 
organization for social change. Is that correct? Right. That's okay. correct. Okay. Yeah. So tell us a little bit, if you can, what life events led you in this direction? Yeah. Um, that is a great question and, and an interesting question. I'll try to consolidate this as quickly as possible. Um, I've always had a passion for leadership, which started at a very, very young age in high school. And we could have a whole discussion on how do people become leaders, but that's not what we're here for. Um, I immediately, my first degree is actually in ornamental horticulture. And I went into a large family business. We had a retail garden center, built a, a pretty big business. It was never my passion though. Um, what I was passionate about was supporting other small business owners. I got very involved in the National Federation of Independent Businesses, did a lot of lobbying for other business owners, and came up with this great idea that I wanted to be an elected official um, and do that on a daily basis. So I ran for office. I lost got, and uh, got that handed to me. But in the process, the University of Buffalo had a Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership and we connected after that. And they're like, hey, listen, if you want to work with businesses, support businesses, we have this opportunity for you. And I went to the University of Buffalo um, while I kept my businesses. So they were, um, I took a clinical position running the Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership, working with small businesses. And part of it was to keep my businesses going um, a as a clinical aspect of that. Then uh, after a while, probably about six or seven years into that, I got very interested in some of the theories of a social work dean at the, at the school, Nancy Smith, who I loved her premise on nonprofits and, and the social sector. And she asked me to do with the School of Management, I was at the School of Management at that time, to do a, a seminar on the entrepreneurial nonprofit and to start to talk about this. That lit the passion under me for both this, I then took a dual appointment at the School of Management and the School of Social Work and was working inside the MBA, MSW programs, helping bring forth this concept of the entrepreneurial and nonprofit. Long story short, Goodwill through a headhunter had reached out to me. I said no for many, many weeks um, until they hit the entrepreneur in me and said, gave me that challenge and said, hey, you talk about this on paper, but here's an opportunity to come out in the real world and live it and do it. And that's how I ended up at Goodwill. And I have never, ever been happier. There were 35 years of pieces getting knit together. And sometimes as you get older, you can see this. That led to what I believe is my purpose right now. And I, and I just absolutely love what I'm doing here with the team at Goodwill. Tell me if you can, what's your normal day like? So normal day is usually, I'm an early morning person. I get up 4.30, 4.45, I go to work out. I'm usually in the office about 7.30. Um, do a lot of interaction with team members, with my direct reports. We're checking in on business um, reports every day. We're checking out our workforce development activities. A lot of meetings with um, leaders in the community. Um, a lot of meetings with funders. And then it's really, it's a very different job. As hard as I work, it doesn't seem like work. And it's a lot less hours than I'm used to. My day usually ends somewhere between five o'clock and 5.30. And what would you say the major constant theme would be? Is it getting people to change? Is it actually fundraising? Is it building relationships in the community? Um, it, for where we're at right now as an organization, my focus is on change management. Um, so we pivoted the organization. I came May 1st, 2020. So a quick side story, I, I agreed to come to Goodwill in February of 2020, but told them I wanted to close out the semester. Between the time I signed my offer letter and the time I came here, this little thing called COVID popped up and I walked into not knowing what COVID was to our entire operations were shut down. We had 200 40 people laid off, all that was working, all of our stores were closed. CFO was working ahead of HR. Um, so that's that's kind of what I walked into. So long story short, our goodwill had largely been serving people with disabilities in a sheltered workshop. 
the board had decided to give that up prior to my coming, but I was the one the fourth day here that signed away the certificate that allowed us to do that type of work. And we were at this in, influx or point where we had to decide what we were going to do going forward. So long story short, we could talk about that for an hour. What I would say is we have been nothing but change management since that day of, of the three choices you give me. It's all about change management, which is all about the people. And at first they had to start with creating the vision, right? And I, and I don't want to get ahead of any questions you may have, but mm -hmm. we can talk more about that. So when you look at the obstacles that are in front of you and you need to work, you said people first, as far as the change, yes. you wanted to develop the vision. What place in your mind does vision hold as an, a catalyst to get people to change? Um, I believe that vision and being really clear about the purpose is the role of the CEO, the most important role, or what I call often referred to as the chief energy officer. Mm -hmm. So vision is what connects, in my opinion, it, it, change management is about connecting to both people's hearts and their heads, right? I think a lot of companies do a great job connecting to the head, the brain part of it, but to really institute change, to truly make sticky change, um, it requires you to grab people's hearts, in my, in my opinion. And that happens with not just a vision, but a big vision that we can share. And I think of my role is to hold that vision flag high uh, and be flying that constantly because just when I'm sick of talking about it, Sometimes people are just beginning to hear it. And um, so that that's where what I think the vision purpose is really all of it, because that's how you attract the right people. That's how you retain talent. And you don't do this as one person the the, the team does this. Right. So you need people around you to do it. And tell us a little bit about how you engage the emotions inside the people what is it that you need to change at the emotional level or bring yeah. out into their awareness from an emotional standpoint to get them to actually change so i look at it as a is giving people the opportunity to have a sense of belonging i don't know how else to say that um so i think we often start with uh hey join this group and then we're going to sort of show you the vision and the roles, I think about it back backwards and then people would belong. I think of it the other way around. People have to belong first before they'll fully join when it comes. And I think that applies to change management. And I think the belonging comes through creating the vision, um, which comes from first really doing the evaluation and understanding what's the as is, you know, of the organization before the change happens. So, you know, who are we? What resources do we have? And then creating where the heart comes in to me is then creating that to be part. Where are we going to be three to five years now? Why do I want to be here? What's our purpose as an organization? What do we do beyond make money and serve people? Like, how are we helping the community in even a bigger way? That to me is where, where you start to get the belonging part. And there's that big gap in between which is all the processes and building mm -hmm. the team and everything else you need to do to, to make it happen. But you've got to, in my opinion, you have to talk about this over and over and over again. In fact, um, we have a meeting next week. We have a, a, every quarter, we have an all managers meeting and then every six months an all hands meeting to just talk about where the company's going, what challenges people are having and keep that vision high. So when you talk about the vision, let's just say the vision, you explain the vision, you develop this picture of the future, yeah. and we'll say that's the, the reasoning side, the intellectual analytical side of what you're forming. And then you take the, we'll say the emotional intelligent or the emotional side, the EQ side, right. where you mentioned you have to build the sense of belonging. Yeah. How do you specifically, what things, what actions do you take that actually gets to their inner emotional self where they do sense and feel like they belong. So it, for me, it comes back to that. Where does it come from? One, it's creating the movement so people can see 
the movement that you want them to join. Like this is how we're moving together. But if you want to get really specific, which I think you're you're asking mm-hmm. me to be a bit more specific here, I believe it it starts with uh, walking the building, talking to people, getting to know people beyond a number and an employee number. We have 200 and I think right now around 240 employees again. Uh, so another interesting story, we've almost tripled our business and we haven't added any headcount, um, which is, which is another Impressive. fascinating story. Yeah. But, but it's that getting people to see that. Um, well, I'll give you one example. I had one today. I had a, a meeting at a store. So I try to visit our individual stores once, at least once every three months or so. And, and I walk into that meeting and I talk about, here's updates about the company, things that are happening. Then I ask them about their successes. They love to share what that is. Then I say, listen, I'm here. I'm the CEO, but there is no filter today. My job is no more important than your job. What are you stuck with? What are your challenges? So I believe it's walking around and listening to people, which then creates more of a personal connection. And that that isn't just Tom. That's my team, that's the managers emulating that and doing that the same. And it's creating those personal connections. How do you do that day in and day out? Because it sounds like what you're trying to do is build a community. Yes. Everybody's accepted. They feel safe and secure going back to yep. Maslow and his hierarchy. So then the next yep. step is bonding. So you get them to bond and they feel safe. They feel secure. And I think everybody initially in a new position in particular, but also on an ongoing basis, they're saying, do I trust these people? Is this trustworthy? Am I a part yep. of a community that I trust? And then that leads to the bonding. So where does feedback, we'll say that's the third component, yep. where does feedback come in to reinforce on an ongoing, consistent basis that bonding? Yeah. So um, it comes through it comes through some of our HR practices. Right? So feedback both ways. So we do pulse surveys internally um, from from our team members to to hear them. We do um, regular, well, twice a year we do more formal reviews, but I always tell my team, like, listen, a review should be nothing more than a checkbox because we should be constantly communicating with our people. So there are no surprises, like what's going well, again, what are the, you know, what are the challenges that people have? But ultimately, I think it, I think where the real bonding happens is when something, something doesn't go well. And then if the leadership team, when things don't go well, can be vulnerable and wholehearted and lean in and say, hey, we messed up. I made a mistake. Um, And again, I can give you just a really quick example. I was out doing these listening sessions. We have an annual banquet and we invite all our employees. And one of the themes that came back were, man, I'd love to bring my spouse. But we charge them to bring their significant other, their plus one. I shouldn't say spouse. They're they're plus one, somebody they'd like to bring with them to hear about our mission, celebrate annually with them. And we didn't offer that. So we did today. We heard that. And we and we just sent out, just sent it an hour ago to say, listen, we heard you. You're Please bring somebody with you and we're going to pick up the cost of that ticket. So that's a little thing, but those happen all the time. And I think a lot of times leaders um, see vulnerability as weakness, almost like you have to be um, careful, you have to be covered, especially with HR and different things, but we try to be wholehearted, vulnerable and, and, you know, expose things when things happen at the leadership level. And I do back to your question. I think that builds trust, psychological safety and bonding. Okay. Well, you're listening and you're hearing them. You mentioned earlier in our conversation that a lot of times nonprofits, um, their social purpose, but they lack in the the ability or the skill sets, I'll say, to scale and get bigger and bigger. So we'll say that's the, again, the IQ side. How do you feed that? How do you develop that in the organization? They feel they were bonded, but when there's a lot of change in the business practices and the, right. um, I'm going to say the pressures to perform from an intellectual manner, technology, yes. using technology today, all those types of things. How do you how do you build that into your plan to grow and scale the organization? Yeah. So I think now we're starting to talk about maybe more specifics of change management and how you might manage change itself. And I, and I think that gets into really change management process and 
you know, understanding that um, installing change and realizing change are two very, very different things. I can install change and say, and we went through this because we totally have changed our operations. That's how we have been successful and, and doubled the, you know, nearly doubled the size of the business is, um, you know, it's this, it, it, to realize change means that people have to own it. So how do you do that? I think it starts with, um, intent, like being really, really clear about what the tent, intent of the change is. What's the purpose of the change? What is this going to look like if we implement it? Why should we do it? And, and we worked really hard on creating an intent statement and sharing that with our teams or employees. Then I think it requires a sponsor. Um, so somebody's got to own that change. In this case, I, the CEO, was the sponsor. And then we sort of like trickled sponsorship down away from the CEO. But what I was saying is, I am supporting this change. I'm going to fund this change. I promise you, I'm going to give you the resources you need. But then we broke it down into teams to make sure that it wasn't being driven from the top, but it was being bubbled up. So we created change management teams. Um, and for instance, in our stores, we changed the, the backroom process significantly. We had cross store teams that went to every store when they were changing their process and led that change management process. Then finally, what I think it comes back to, you've got the execution piece, then how do you make it sticky? So mm -hmm. it's not letting go of what you change. It's going back. It's monitoring change. It's not going to be perfect. There's going to be hiccups. People, you know, I think of change as like a rubber band that you stretch, especially when you're doing really big changes. And people often forget um, organizations, it doesn't matter if you're for-profit, non-profit, organizations our systems and systems are naturally inoculated against change. They don't want it because the system's working the way it is. So it's going back and making sure we keep that rubber. I always say to the team, stretch the rubber band, stretch the rubber band, making sure we're trying to keep the rubber band stretched. Using the metaphor of the rubber band, what do you do when people just don't want to stretch? Right. So this comes and this is an area when we first started, um, what I'd like to do a redo when I said nonprofits, I did not mean all nonprofits. I was referring to a select group of nonprofits. This is where that group falls down when I talked about best business practices and it comes to accountability. So what we do, we have one of our um, mantras uh, is that we believe in strong accountability and then in parentheses we put with constant coaching. And all that means is to us here is accountability doesn't mean punitive or we're, we're running around trying to catch people doing bad things and we're going to fire you. It means here's what we're doing. It's really clear. We have to let you know what the parameters are of what we're doing, how you do it, and then holding people accountable to it. And when it doesn't go well, we coach people. But back to your question, when we've coached three times, four times, five times, then you, this comes back to me to a best business practice. You have to have the courage to let people go. If you don't, my experience is um, if you let what I would call a C player become a bit of a cancer in your organization, your A players are going to walk out the door because they can go anywhere they want. And I think as business leaders, where I found in, in this change process here, where we've really run into some difficult, challenging things that we've had addressed as leaders are what I would call a, a C player, which to me is somebody that has no agreement with our core values, but is very productive. So they do their job very well. And we often get caught up like, I can't let that person go because they're so productive and you can't get stuck in that trap because it's the culture that's going to win every time. And if you leave the cancer within the culture, it's going to ruin it. Okay. When, when you talk about um, the coaching and the, the bonding, which is the emotional or the, the EQ type of um, environment, what kind of data do you use to bring that together and to validate your assumptions? Because it's so easy to put your yeah. own cognitive biases in front of everything and yes. people's opinions. So how do you use data in particular, when it comes to measuring the emotional work environment? Yeah, so 
on the business side, it's easy, right? Well, it's not easy. You still have to interpret the data, yeah. right? People make right. mistakes there too, chasing the data. I don't know they have a great, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know I have mm -hmm. a great answer with that. I, mm -hmm. To answer a question, what I would say is um, you are right about biases and you've heard some of them just in this conversation, right? We all have them. Um, I, when it comes to the people development side, we use a lot of outside resources. So I guess that's my filter a lot. We use a lot of outside coaches. We have our own internal Goodwill Academy training, but we bring other people in to run that. I didn't create the content. We help them create the content in that and giving them information about what the teams needed. But other than that, I don't have a great, um, you know, we do pulse surveys. I guess that would be some data. Mm -hmm. You're, mm -hmm. you're listening. It's um, it's often qualitative data mm -hmm. more than quantitative, which makes it even harder. People mm -hmm. have to take the time to read through it and ask more questions. And I, I think the other is listening, you know, doing listening sessions as much as we can. Although, to your point, those are biased right away because the CEO is in the back room. And how much are they really going to say to the CEO, even if they do feel like it's a safe space? Yeah. So not a great answer for that one for you, but um, that's the best I can do for that question. And, and now you made me think I have to go back and look at that a little bit harder. So my, my compliments to you, you seem like a genuine individual and person and knowing you don't have all the answers is a sign of a very good leader. So my compliments to you as an aside on that. What about feedback in general? Where does the role of feedback and quantifying the, the meaning of the feedback come into play in running so, the organization? Yeah. So feedback, I'm, I'm going to look at a, two sides, the people side and the, and the um, purely business data side. A lot of what we do is it's an interesting business because we have to create our inventory every morning. We get donations, thank, mm -hmm. thankfully to generous people. And our job is to maximize the value of those donations. We take the profit from those donations and feed our workforce development teams. That's how we pay for our workforce development, and thus the social innovation model. Not every nonprofit, in fact, very few have the opportunity that we have in mm -hmm. front of us to be able to do that. Um, but the data, I think we, we measure just about anything you can think of on the business side. But again, I think we use that to inform things, but we only use the data. I, I stress to my team, date, if you use data and make decisions in the moment, you're making some horrible decisions because there's this, uh, data tells a story and it's our job as leaders to try to peel back that data and understand what the story is. And an example would be when it comes to the people side, we measure production and we may have a, a statistic that we expect people to sort and hang, let's just say, 100 pieces of clothing an hour, but the data is showing they're only doing 70. Um, so if that if it's one or two stores, it's a coaching opportunity. If it's every production person, that's a management opportunity for us to go back and say, boy, do we have the right goal even for people? So I, I think it's using the data, but constantly looking at it and not letting, not making um, impulsive decisions based on data points because I because I think that's a mistake a lot of people make. It, it's what's underneath causing this to happen or what's underneath all that data. Mm, yeah, I find I find when I go into different organizations, uh, I've been in business. I've had my own business starting at twenty six. When I go in, I always look for feedback loops in organizations. Mm. What kind of feedback loop do they have put in place? What are they doing with the data? That's a very key area to look at. And, and as I say that, um, I find it very interesting on, on your um, inner, um, the, the website that you have, you have something that's called circular economy. Evidently, you've done some training in that. Could you explain a little bit more of what you mean by that? Yeah, yeah. Can I really quick, I want to make yep. a comment about the feedback loop because I mm -hmm. think you brought up a great point. Um, that we didn't talk about. To gain feedback from people, there's nothing worse you can do, whether it's customers or we'll stick with our own internal employees for this. To ask for and gain feedback and to not close that loop is is almost like an incorrectable mistake as a leader. So I, I just wanted to stress, like, we didn't talk about that till you did. And that's really important because 
when we do a pulse survey, if we, people are saying things, it's really important that we go back and we close that loop with people to find out, or even a customer. If we do a net promoter score and somebody writes a comment, they you know dislike Goodwill for A, B, and C, to leave that hanging out there, you don't necessarily have to do something for them or fix it, but you have to communicate with them. So sorry for diverging for a second there, but I thought your, your point was, was really, really good. Um, back to your question, which I already forgot. I'm sorry. Okay. No problem. <laughs> it, it says on your LinkedIn profile, you talk a little oh, bit about some uh, circular economy that yeah. uh, caught my eye. I'm wondering if yeah. you could explain it to us. So, so one of the goals that we here, have here at Goodwill because we're use, we're taking people's donations, we get some wonderful stuff and we also get what what our sometimes ends up in landfill. So our goal is to we're we're on a pathway to be zero waste certified in the next probably three to four years. And part of that is understanding the circular economy, meaning think of it this way, instead of we often talk about cradle to grave with a product, right? What how did it start and where does it end up safely? To me, circular economy thinks more about cradle to cradle. So the materials that maybe the fabrics that went into a piece of clothing, if we can't sell it, what else can we use it for? If we can't use it for something else, how do we get it back to the original components so it can be reused again? So that it's thinking just about the, the whole circle of, of um, you know, the, the ecology mm -hmm. of the, the products. Is, okay. Yes, we've had. I'm not a deep expert in it by any means, but it's something I've had some training in and it's very, it's important to us that we can talk about sustainability and really reduce the amount of waste that goes in a landfill um, from the work that we're doing. And again, people don't, do I said garbage, people never donate garbage, but one man's mm -hmm. treasure is another man's garbage yeah. sometimes, yeah. for lack of a better way of saying it. I understand. I understand. Tom, you mentioned that you grew since COVID, I think, two or three times. Is that, am I correct on that? Yeah, yeah. But you so, maintained um, the present headcount, the same headcount. Yeah, yeah. That's a phenomenal accomplishment in productivity. How did you do that? Well, one is um, the business changed so much post-COVID. It, it, I would say this, when it comes to change management, I don't believe the 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 amount of change that we went through COVID as horrible as it is. And I hate to say this became a cover for change. It was an opportunity to mm -hmm. do change quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and that I probably, we, we wouldn't be anywhere close to here, but we had that opportunity because we were shut down. The way we did it was really just took lean best business practices into the back, starting in the back rooms of our businesses. So how do we, we used to do some central processing here. We moved the processing into at the store level so that when somebody donated, we tried to keep the product in the store so we weren't driving it around, moving it around. And we still have to do that a little bit, but as much as we can. Looked at logistics routes, looked at movement. How do we minimize the amount of space or, or steps somebody has to take? And there was just lots of low hanging fruit. So we went from six and a half million dollars in 2020, which we got beat up some with COVID. Um, we will finish this year in retail at about $16 million. And next year we expect to probably be somewhere around 17.5, um, going to 30, our goal is to go to 30 million by 2030. Okay, great, great, great track record on that. If you looked out and said, if I had a magic wand, what one thing do you think you would bring into the organization that would be the biggest leverage point for good? Really capture what you need and what you want to get into that next higher level of organizational profile, we'll say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at this point, um, this may sound trivial, but it's not. Uh, I believe, and we're, we're beginning to work on this, the thing that's going to take our, our organization to the to the next level in so many ways is storytelling and being able to tell the story of this organization, the work it does in the community, and the work that the team has done to take it from where it was to where it is. So we've actually engaged a professor at Georgetown University that we're bringing in to work with us. We've done 
couple storytelling classes, but it's not embedded as part of our culture. And I really, and I don't do a great job at it. Um, and I really think that that is going to take this goodwill to a new level. We are getting a lot of notice by nationally by what we've done we we do i did bring part of a university background we do a lot of research papers that we release and share with the community about workforce development that's gaining us attention but i want to tell the story of the people here and the people that we serve and do a much better job of it yeah i uh, <clears throat> i'm very familiar with the story narrative and uh yeah. you know i'm very familiar with a lot of the mythology behind it and why it's important I find the most interesting companies are the ones that develop their people the most. Yes. And that almost becomes their purpose because they manage future business growth because without yep. them, you can't grow. You can't just yep. recruit and bring in. So yep. I find that very attractive and interesting as far as the storytelling. I see good organizations that do it tell a great story of why it's important to them to grow their people. So my compliments on that. Yeah, because you, again, um, I feel like I should be interviewing you because you have a lot of lot of good <laughs> input here. But we have one of our values is people first. And you're absolutely right. Without great people, you can't do anything. So I the, the reason I think storytelling will help is it will help us attract talent, help us retain talent, um, and help us, you know, really continue to develop talent and will it will make goodwill a little bit more stickier place to work. Mm -hmm. Another thing I believe in that we're trying to build in our culture when it comes to people is we want to know where people want to be three or five years from now. And it doesn't have to be at Goodwill. And when we know that we can help develop those team members to their personal goals, we, they actually stay longer has been right. my experience. So to your, to your, again, to one of your points, yeah, investing in people is critical, is, is critically important to, to running a successful business. Yeah. I, I, I find that exact same thing as you just articulated and 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 I think that's what makes brings excitement to the business because now everybody has a feel of wonder in themselves of mm -hmm. I can contribute mm -hmm. this where do I want to go and I totally agree in my experience with you that if you invest in somebody you have a better chance they're going to stick around versus go for the next $1 increase per hour or whatever it would be because they feel a sense of obligation that you've helped build me. Maybe I can help build the organization now. Yeah. And I think, and I think that's right. On yeah. Especially true of the younger generations too. Yeah. I, I see that even more so. Tom, you've got a very accomplished background. What lies in the future for you and Goodwill? Well, what lies in the future for Goodwill is our big, hairy, audacious goal um, that we set uh, four years ago now. So by 2030, the reason I came here is we want to be 90% self-funded into perpetuity from our business operation. So that's a big, that's my big goal to help lead us there. That's an organization's big goal. And then at that point, um, it's, it's time for retirement for me, probably. Um, this is, this is the very back end of my career. I'm sure I'll, you know, do consulting or something at that point, I'll never stop working. That's not, not who I am as long as I'm able to, but, um, I feel, you know, I, and I'm, I'm happy to share this. I'm 64 and I, and I feel, um, that I've got another four or five good years of work. If, if I can stay healthy, maybe a little bit longer, but it's also a timing issue too. I don't want to leave the team. I, I led this vision creating it. It's, um, it's a it's a difficult transition to go from you know being largely grant funded to being self funding and i i feel it'd be a really bad leadership for me to walk out of here when i turn 65 in the middle of the transition at the same time i'm very much thinking about succession planning building internal talent getting the business ready for either external or internal talent that will be the board's decision someday but I don't want succession to be an event. I want it to be a process. And I do want to pay attention to there may be a time to leave earlier because it's the right thing to do. But we'll we'll cross those bridges when they come. If there's somebody talented and they're ready to take over and you've got some young energy that can reinvigorate things. Um, so I don't have anything cut in stone, but that's a rough idea of what's happening. You, 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 uh, <laughs> 
you're a very conscientious person and you appear to be that way and my compliments and i think you are a very young 64 so i hope you has a lot of years yeah. ahead where you can help them and uh, direct in what they're doing thomas somebody wants to talk to you personally about anything that they've heard today what's the best place to contact you yeah so they can find me on linkedin that's probably the easiest easiest way you know you can search goodwill western new york or thomas albrecht you'll find me um you, i'm happy to you know take an email it's t albrecht t-u-l-b-r-i-c-h at goodwill wny.org and that's org not com okay uh i can tell you this is a very interesting conversation for me because i think we have so many um, ideas and uh, lessons we've learned maybe that are in alignment. I'd love to stay in touch with you to, to yeah. actually document maybe the progress you're making in these endeavors and I, uh, make that I available would, to the general public. I would love to do that. And the other thing is, I just want to thank you, Ted. I believe in, you know, we're trying to create to a culture of continuous learning. I can never learn enough. And I feel like i you know, you, you challenged me on a couple of things. It didn't challenge me, but it made me think like, ah, there's something I go back and look at. And you brought up some really good points. So thank you for uh, letting me learn a little bit today, too. So I appreciate that. Okay. Well, thank you, Tom. And I look forward to future conversation. I have no doubt we'll have them. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks so much. Take care. Hi, Ted Wolf here. I want to thank you for joining us for this Implementers video. The Implementers podcast is presented by Guidewise, where we, along with our vetted member community, recognize that ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. To learn more about getting things done with Guidewise, please visit us at guidewise.io. And to conquer your implementation struggles, please like and share this video and subscribe to our channel. Happy implementing.